first, I'm the executive director of Reconciling Ministries Network. Excuse me, while the recording in process <laughs> comes on. Um, and we're very glad that you're with us tonight. Um, this is kind of a first for us. Um, and to ensure that everyone who wants to participate can participate and attend, we did not charge a fee, although we are billing this as a fundraiser. Um, it's kind of, like I said, it's a first. We don't usually do things like this, but we're just checking it out to see how it goes over with folks. So we'll be asking some of you for feedback afterwards. Um, so that we can see if this is a potential revenue stream for us in, in, in future with future events. Um, as most of you know, we are funded exclu almost exclusively by the donations of people and, and churches that are part of the movement. Um, and we deeply appreciate all of that because it is only through those things that we're able to do this work. Um, tonight, um, you are all muted. Um, we welcome questions. Please put them in the chat um, and we'll try to get to them at the end. Um, I will answer the one that just popped up right now. Can we still donate? Absolutely. Um, there is a link, rmnetwork.org backslash donate, um, and you can donate there at any point. Um, so without further ado, I want to go ahead and, and let us get started. Um, we're speaking with three Reconciling United Methodists today. They've been in vital forms of ministry for various lengths of time and different forms of ministry. Some of them are newer to ministry than others. Um, but they all have deep and well-founded hopes for the United Methodist Church. So we're going to let, we've invited them to share with us and kind of share their hopes and dreams for the future. Um, but first, I'm going to let each one of them introduce themselves to you. So panelists, if you would um, introduce yourself, your name, your pronouns, where you're from, um, and ways in which you serve our church. Um, and I will start with Lisette. Thank you, Jen. I'm Reverend Lisette Perez. I'm a clergy serving in Oasis United Methodist Church. It's a Hispanic Latino ministry, uh, a church in the Greater New Jersey Annual Conference. And um, my pronouns is ella, which is she in Spanish, her, hers. And um, I'm, I also... I'm a leader of the National Church. Um, I'm the president of Marsha, the National Hispanic Caucus. And I also uh, serve in different committees in the, at the national level, like the connectional table, and also jurisdictional level and conference level. And I'm so glad that I was invited to be part of this. I, I, I invite now uh, Reverend Cedric. Thank you, Lizette, and good evening to all of you. I am the Reverend Cedric Bridgeforth. I serve in the California Pacific Conference in Los Angeles, California, to be specific. Pronouns are he, him. My service in the church, uh, beyond that, uh, in the past of serving as a pastor and also as a district superintendent, now brings me to a conference staff position where my title is Director of Innovation and Communication. I also uh, have the great privilege of serving as head of delegation to our general and jurisdictional uh, conference. And that's a role that has lived on and on and on. And so uh, as many of you understand, we're just waiting. So that's my introduction and I will uh, invite uh, JJ to introduce. Good evening, everybody. It is great to be here with you all. My name is JJ Warren, and I use he, him pronouns. Uh, you'll have to excuse the phone ringing in the background. Uh, I'm a Gen Zer, and I haven't quite figured out how to answer one of these old cordless phones yet, um, but we'll get there. Um, so I am currently uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. I just finished my uh, seminary master's of divinity degree there. Woohoo! And um, Thank you, thanks. And um, I get to serve the church as a lay person for now. I'm in the ordination process and um, I like to be a 21st century circuit rider. So 
Uh, a lot of my work involves traveling to churches. Many of your churches I see here, I've had the opportunity to be in relationship with in some way over the past few years. And um, so that's what I enjoy doing and how I like serving the church, um, as well as being a general conference delegate uh, whenever that happens. So thanks for having me tonight. And I'm so glad to be here uh, with Reverend Cedric and Reverend Lissette. You're muted, Jen. Sorry, it helps if I unmute myself. Thank you all for your work and witness in the United Methodist Church and for being with us tonight. Um, I know that you've uh, each taken time out of your schedules to be here and we really appreciate it. So my next question is really about what the church means to you. Um, and in your answers to that, please feel free to give examples you know, what's worked well, what hasn't worked well, but what is, what is the church at its core when it's at its best? What does it mean to each of you? Um, I will start with um, Cedric this time. Great. What is the church to me and how is the church at its best? Uh, thanks for this question. I think for me, the church is, you know, that thing that lives in the heart of those who are called to follow Jesus. And I believe that is best expressed uh, when uh, we are able to um, speak openly about our faith, but also speak openly about our trials, our struggles, and to do that in community. I believe the church is at its best when I get to experience things like, uh, you know, church folk coming together uh, to form a community garden or to offer a craft fair where young artisans or uh, folks who are struggling to get by can come and sell their goods. I think the church is at its best when it's doing a beach cleanup and nobody asks them to do it. I think the church is at its best when we uh, find those times and those spaces to pull away and really seek to hear the voice of God. Um, to hear what God is speaking to us in our present time, and to do that beyond our political leanings or perspectives, but to really just pull away and uh, experience that discipline of silence and of prayer, and to do that uh, in communal settings. So for me, that, that's the church, and that's how I see the church at its best. Okay, Lisette. Same Thank question. You, um, for me, the church, of course, we always define church as the body of Christ. And because of that, that's what, what comes from the, from the letters in the New Testament. For me, it is important for us to, to, to feel that we are Christ in the world, that we are doing what God calls us to do through Jesus Christ. And there's such, such a thing for me when people of faith, that believe in Jesus and the message and the teachings and how Jesus lived, something happens when we gather. This, this um, opportunity that we have every week to gather and to be present with each other. And during the pandemic, we were extremely creative to gather in Zoom and other ways. I think that is extremely important when we gather as people of faith to celebrate what we believe and to motivate each other to do something about being in partnership with God to build the kingdom of God in heaven, I, on earth as it is in heaven. And, and I think and truly believe that the church as best is when we really live what we believe. Sometimes we don't live what we believe. And, and I, I saw the church as best, for example, during the pandemic, um, many, many things that we did, including being a, a place that our, our, our church, our build, church building was a place for testing for COVID-19. We connected with other churches in the area to vaccinate uh, people and to provide appointments for over 4,000 people. And we were part of the BLM movement. We were part of so many things that were going on through the pandemic. And now that we're coming back, there's a new energy of trying to be the church in this broken world and, and a world full of all kinds of violence and difficulties. So, so I believe that we, when we leave the church right, we can transform the world and bring some hope in the midst of everything. Now our church is broken and it's fragmented with all that is going on. 
but it is extremely important for me to see and to know that the church is inclusive for all people. All people from the beginning, when, when Peter had this vision that the church, that God loves all the Gentiles and that grace of God was for all the Gentiles, not only to the particular Jewish community. He said, if God, if God is saying that, who am I to be objecting God? Who am I to do what God, uh, I mean, to, to do something different of what God wants us to do? In Acts eleven seventeen, that's what Peter says. You know, who am I to object to the vision that God has to become a church? So it has to be inclusive. All people needs to be part of this building of the kingdom of God, belonging to each other and trying to make a difference in the world. Thank you. Thanks, Lisette. JJ, same question. Yeah, yeah, I, I really appreciate that uh, was said about the body of Christ. And I think that it, it raises questions, especially during the pandemic, of what it means to be a body, uh, to be in bodies, to be embodied as a community. And, and I really like this question because I think that the church isn't just something that we do, but that it's something that we are and that we are becoming. Uh, and it's something that we become when we're in relationship together. Uh, and I'm really influenced by uh, my academic advisor at BU, um, Dr. Brian Stone, who wrote this really great book called Evangelism After Christendom. Highly recommend it. Um, Evangelism After Christendom by Brian Stone. And he talks about the church he says it's a distinct form of social existence, end quote. It's about a community and the ways that we intentionally approach and engage in this community. And so in this way, the church is in Methodist fashion and lingo, uh, a connection. The church is a network of relationships, I believe. And it's not merely a structure or a governing body, but the church is about relationships. And that's what excites me about the church, and especially about the United Methodist Church, is that in a chaotic time like the one we find ourselves in, uh, which is full of upheaval, we get to question everything that we've ever taken for granted about the church, and we get to see and explore the possibilities that are out there for our future. And part of this questioning, I think, means refocusing our polity so that no longer our polity puts us into situations where we're debating and fighting, but that our polity would serve the relationships of what it means to be a global church, that our polity would serve and center international relationships in a way that is mutual, beneficial, and respectful. So when I think about the church, I think about relationships and these relationships being part of what John Wesley called holy conferencing, right? That when we come together and have dialogues, it should be a means of grace, a way that we encounter God through one another, a way that we become the church in communion, in relationship. And I've witnessed this in some ways, even in the midst of Robert's Rules of Order, uh, breaking through the cracks <laughs> of our conference, right? But even amidst Robert's Rules of Order, there are times, and you know, Cedric and Lisette know this as general conference delegates and involved, there are moments uh, when the spirit breaks through and when we're able to actually hear one another as humans, uh, as beloved. Um, and, and one of those times for me, and I'll wrap up after this, is um, after that general conference, um, after I gave my speech, these delegates from a country where it's still illegal to perform same-sex acts came up to me and they said, our bishop who never shows emotion was weeping after you spoke because he had never heard from a gay United Methodist before, which isn't to say uh, that there aren't gay United Methodists in his area, uh, but that our church forced us to be in relationship. And in that moment, we had a breakthrough. And so that's what excites me about the future of the church is when we're at our best, we're a relational structure where people from different parts of the world are brought together to hear one another's stories. And we're oriented by the radical love of a relational God. So that's what the church means to me and what I hope uh, that we become in the future. Thanks. 
Thanks. Um, so as I just was sitting here making some notes on what everybody said, there were some some words that came up over and over, right? The words were gathering of people or being in relationship or community or all people. Um, so all of those things are life-giving to me when when you hear them because that those are what that is what the church is about right that is what we're supposed to be about is these relationships um but i want to ask um just as a follow-up and i'm not everybody doesn't have to answer this but if any of you have an example um from your local area we talked about a little bit as a couple of you did about the pandemic and the impact of us not being not gathering in person for for a long period of time so is there a, a ministry or any impact that you saw as a result of the pandemic that was life breathing or life giving in your particular areas? What were some of the positive things that we can can take out of that that will see us into the future? Yeah, one thing uh, that I can share, and I, you know, mentioned community garden, and that's because I was watching videos earlier of uh, some of our churches that have started community gardens over the last couple of years, because, you know, people couldn't be indoors and feel safe. Folks were outside. There's a real recognition of food insecurity all around us, and also a recognition that one thing most churches have is some land unused land, which uh, just is an untapped resource and a great community asset. And so several of our churches here within the city of Los Angeles devoted uh, their green spaces to uh, community gardens, and they partnered with com other community agencies and uh, farmers markets, food banks. Uh, one church has an ongoing relationship with Trader Joe's, and so uh, they have a huge community garden and a food uh, distribution program, and that has started to spread to multiple churches within our area. Again, it was an opportunity for the church folk to come outside of the building to do something with the land uh, that was sitting there idle and uh, a way to invite the community to come to be a part of it, not just to observe it, but to participate uh, in planting and harvesting and sharing uh, the fruit of the vine. And I, I think there's something deeply theological and life-giving about that. I agree. That's, that's a great story. Thanks. I already mentioned um, that our church was together with other churches. Uh, we were in partnership trying to provide access to the vaccine. This is before it was not accessible for the Hispanic, Latinos, African-Americans, and many undocumented people. And we were able to reach out to our community, especially those who were afraid to show up because they didn't have the resources. And it was intentional. Um, and we were able to, as I mentioned before, to reach out in, in this effort to 4,000 people. And this is before um, the, you know, before the, the vaccine was not as accessible as it is now. Um, I, I saw how the, the whole church was looking for people to make sure that they had the vaccination. And, and I saw how people were caring for each other. And, and that was something that I saw it before uh, the pandemic, but when the pandemic came that a lot of people were suffering because of, loss of, of loved ones, because of people were sick. Um, this was a different caring. This is like second mile, third mile caring, but people going to the houses to, to drop things for people who were infected with COVID and so on and so forth. I, I think that that's, that was something, it's a different caring that I saw during the pandemic. Uh, we were able to continue all the ministries of the church. We were able to be creative in the midst of um, lack of resources for a Hispanic Latino uh, church. We were able to find people who were able to help us with all the technology, and we were able to have uh, youth groups and, and children's ministry and all of the different ministries of the church through technology, through the whole uh, time in the, in the pandemic. And we were able to do the services outside, and we were in relationship, as JJ said, in relationship with all our neighbors. That was something different. You know, we were outside every Sunday and all the neighbors were listening to, to the worship service. And that was something that was different. Um, and, 
And I, I really appreciated the fact that the church was going in, even in the midst of all the different challenges that we were facing. Okay, thanks. I, uh, I had the opportunity during the pandemic um, to interview United Methodist pastors um, around the world and um, as part of my seminary research. And uh, what I found was, it was really interesting. A lot of churches, um, like we've heard now, their relationships, some things that they had taken for granted, like the fact that you'll see um, you know, Sandy at coffee hour and you can just say hello and like that's enough to sustain your relationship with Sandy for a while, even if you don't have a deep conversation, that because they weren't able to have those casual conversations, they actually had to invest in those relationships. Um, and so they, a lot of the churches um, were excited about the fact that they now had phone trees to make sure that every single person in their congregation was getting a phone call once a week from somewhere, and here's my phone call, um, from uh, someone in their congregation. So that, that was really neat to see folks investing in relationships more. Uh, and I'll meet myself so I can answer this phone call. <laughs> okay. Um, so those are all great. And the reason I asked that follow-up question is, is I've seen some really tremendous examples of local churches coming together to do things in different communities that didn't end when we suddenly went back to meeting in person. You know, they're, they're still continuing. And, and I think that's, you know, that's, again, that's what the church is about, right? And, and hopefully those things that Cedric's Community Garden, those kinds of things continue long beyond, you know, our um, need to, to have safe spaces where we can gather because we couldn't gather during a pandemic. Okay. Um, so we have one more question, um, and I'm going to ask it, um, and then we'll then we'll go to to the questions that are in the chat. So if you have questions for our panelists, now would be a good time to start um, thinking about what they might be and typing them in the chat. I want to make sure we save some some time and space from that, and I also want to remind you all that this is a fundraiser of a sort and that the donate link is also in the chat should you choose to to do so um so our final question um really it's more than a than a single question but the global methodist church has broken away um you've it's been announced you we've had several annual conferences that are consider considering disaffiliations of churches that, that want to move to the Global Methodist Church. Um, so that's happening, even though we haven't had a general conference. So my question is around what your hope is for the United Methodist Church moving forward. What can we reasonably become? First part of the question. Second part of the question is, in your wildest dreams, what would the United Methodist Church be? So that's really two different questions, but but I'd like to hear your your thoughts on that. JJ, I'll start with you this time. All right. Well, since we're Methodists and we're moving on to perfection, I'm going to combine them. So what we could reasonably become <laughs> and what my wildest dreams would be, they're going to be the same thing. Um, so my long-term goal, uh, you know, by the time that I'm, oh, I don't know, 40 or 50, so that's <laughs> 20 or 30 years from now, um, I, I hope, my hope is that we'll be a church that has learned not to take for granted the real gifts that United Methodism particularly has to offer the church and the world. What do I mean by that? One, and I promise there's only two. Uh, one, our concept of connection is uniquely United Methodist. And this began, as some of you remember from confirmation, uh, in John Wesley's early preaching circuits around the United Kingdom, um, and then in the US with Francis Asbury, the first bishop here. Um, and now our idea of connection has grown into this idea of a global network. Lisette serves on the connectional table. And so thinking about this idea of connection and what it means to us, we are one of the only Protestant denominations that is still one denomination 
around the globe, though we have splintered and uh, uh, had different groups break off throughout our history, we're one of the only Protestant denominations where a United Methodist in Kenya is equally as United Methodist as a United Methodist in Kansas. And I think that is something that United Methodism can really um, embrace but we haven't done this well, at least in my opinion. We haven't respected the equal nature of what it means to be United Methodist in a global church. We in the US, in my opinion, have orient, we haven't oriented ourselves to truly be a global church that embraces and makes space for the uniqueness of what it means to be United Methodist in each region where the United Methodist Church exists. And this um, awareness comes from a trip that I took uh, with young people from the Northeast jurisdiction when I was in high school, not that long ago, about 10 years ago, can you believe it or not? Um, and we went to India and on the first day, uh, an Indian theologian asked us this rhetorical question. He said, in India, we have to ask ourselves, what is Indian about Christianity? And what is Christian about India? What is Indian about Christianity and what is Christian about India? And I, I really, this question has sat with me for all of these years and I think about this every time I visit a new church to say, what is Methodist about the way that we do church here in Boston? And what is distinctly Bostonian about the, the way that we live out and perform Methodism? And so thinking about the ways that each of us, no matter where we are in the world, embody Methodism today, I think that's a really great gift that we can continue, uh, I hope, uh, to nurture as part of a global church, to respect our differences and to embrace them, to make space to discuss them um, and, and to learn and enrich one another by them. So I hope that we'll become a model for what it looks like to be a multicultural denomination, one where each region is equally respected, affirmed, and encouraged, where we take time to foster relationships between United Methodists of different states, countries, and continents. Could you imagine if we had a global gathering where people from all around the connection came together and spent time getting to know each other instead of debating? What a radical idea where our spiritual lives enrich each other and where the divine can be experienced through the diversity of our connection. And two, uh, finally, uh, obviously I hope that we'll become a queer church. And what I mean by that is not that we'll be a church where everybody's gay, uh, although that could be a fun experiment. Our music would ob obviously be great, um, but by queer, I mean, uh, and here I'm using a definition from a new friend and colleague, his name is Brandon Crowley. He's a Black uh, Baptist queer pastor and a professor at Harvard whose class I had the opportunity to take this last semester. Um, and so by queering, Brandon Crowley says, queering is a process of perpetual subversion, end quote. And by subversion, he says, it's a process of re-education from the very foundations of our faith so that we are constantly re-examining whether our churches are affirming of the full diversity of humanity. So by saying that I hope the United Methodist Church will become a queer denomination, I mean that I hope we will be a church that is constantly in process, much like Wesley said, we are always moving on toward perfection, a church in process that challenges its own assumptions and society's assumptions, a church that challenges binaries like the gender binary, a church that challenges binaries like powerful and powerless, a church that is fluid and open to new insights and ways of thinking and experiences, a church that centers the marginalized, a church that is sexually liberated. Why the hell, heck, for kids watching in 2022, do Canada for ordination have to say that we will commit to celibacy in singleness and a church that celebrates all of what it means to be human, sexuality and all. 
I hope for United Methodist Church that is constantly queering and being queered, a church that is constantly being broken open so that the divine can be experienced in more and not less ways. So that's my hope for the church. Wow, thanks. <laughs> um, Cedric. Sure, you make me go after JJ. See, it reminds <laughs> me of how long I've been out of seminary, but uh, but grateful for that uh, inspiration. And I would say that my wildest dreams are reasonable. Uh, so, like JJ, I'll combine <laughs> my my answers. And for me, you know, what's reasonable and what's what's captured within my wildest dreams for the church is a vision of a church that is for all and includes every. And that's, that's every, every hue, every shade, every thought, every idea, just space for people to just be human and be in community together. Uh, what's also reasonable within my wildest dreams is that we would be unified in a mission that's focused on impact. How are we impacting not just those of us who are inside, but those of us who are all around and those who've been pushed to the outside and that we actually go beyond making statements, but we move in action and activities uh, that, again, are focused on impact. When we, uh, you know, have conversations about those seeking asylum at our borders, that that's not just a conversation or a resolution, but there's an actual plan that we look at our country's broken immigration uh, we'll call them laws, uh, you know, but but we look at those and we actively engage, you know, ways to address those. We actively engage uh, issues around voter suppression and affordable housing, an equitable economy, a safe space for children, compassion and uh, affirmation, inclusion and uh, embrace for uh, all of us who uh, identify as queer, LGBTQIA, uh, that we do some real work around those who uh, were formerly incarcerated and that we also do the work that's necessary to acknowledge uh, Native and First Peoples and have conversations about reparations and move beyond repentance, but really move to a space of impact and action in every space where people come together and proclaim the name of Jesus. For me, that is the hope of the church. For me, if we're not focused on impact, we're just, uh, just going around in circles wasting each other's times and occasionally getting a good song and a decent sermon out of it. Thanks, Cedric. Um, Lisette, your turn. Thank you. I concur with, I'm sorry, with JJ and Cedric. I, I think that I also dream for the church that is full inclusive and for everybody is a, our theology is so beautiful. I, I just wish people can understand what we believe and, and our theology so we can really spread the way that we understand God and God's relationship for, for the people of God. Um, I, I think that sometimes in the church, people don't understand what we believe well. And, and it's a beautiful theology of grace that is that reach out to everybody. Um, and that's very unique for our United Methodists. I dream of a church that is not only white and middle class. And I say it like that because only 8% of our local congregations are racial ethnic. And that's a big problem because we have people who are racial ethnic, who are Blacks and Hispanics, Latinos and Asians and Native America that are out there and we can share with them this theology that we have that reaches out to everybody. So we have to be intentional, intentional of reaching out people who are completely different to us. And of course, all genders are included in that grace. We need to be in relationship, as JJ said, with people who are very different and try to understand how they see God and how can we be in relationship with each other and how we can build together the kingdom of God. I have been in ministry for 30 years and I have seen, I mean, I have fought so much and advocate for all the people who are oppressed within the church. 
So I want a church that is it, not oppressive, that on the contrary, it's a church that is open to just live the gospel and make an impact and transform the world truly. I want a church and I want to dream for a church that everybody is included, that young people are in leadership like JJ and these new pastors can be part of this new movement of the United Methodist Church, young pastors and young leaders that are part of those who have been uh, there longer. I mean, the, the, the children and the youth are the leadership of today. They're the church of today. We can learn a lot about the children and the young people. I dream of a church that is inclusive in terms of, of all the different isms, you know, and make sure that everybody is included every single person can live this grace that we have and is available to others. I think that that's fair. I mean, Martin Luther King dream about it and we still don't see it, but we have to continue and hope for that church to become a reality before we die, please. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you all, very, very, very powerful. Um, words from all of you and, and something for all of us to aspire to. And I love, love that, that all of you answered both pieces of that question the same way. Um, so we have a few minutes left um, and I see that we have a few questions that have been asked in the chat. So I'm gonna um, move to a, a couple of those. Um, the first one is, what do you think the UMC has to learn from our ecumenical siblings in this season? JJ, you want to take that one? Ooh, I was going to defer to one of my more seasoned colleagues. Um, but my first input would, you know, my first thought is, our, our conversations with the Episcopal Church have been put on hold. Um, and I, I really hope that that's a conversation I don't think a lot of Methodists know is happening. Um, and I think that that's something important that we should have. There's a really cool video out there um, with two bishops from the Episcopal Church and from the Methodist Church talking about similarities that we have. Um, and, and I think that the Episcopal Church, you know, they're not perfect, but they went through this process of inclusion um, a, a while ago. And so to learn from their process, even just to learn the mistakes that they made, um, but also to see what they did well as we become a church, you know, in the near future that is LGBTQ plus affirming, um, what does that actually look like on the ground? I think that'd be really interesting to learn from churches like uh, the Presbyterian Church and the Episcopal Church, what that looked like for them. Um, yes, I would, I would like to say that if we truly want to transform our communities, we have, it's a must, we have to work with our ecumenical um, uh, churches and congregations, and even more, the interfaith congregations. I have done that in every single um, opportunity that I have, in every single parish ministry that I have been involved. And it's extremely important to, for the pastors to model that for the community that is possible to live in a community where all the different traditions of faith can work together for a better community, for a better world. Uh, I think it's a must. If we want to truly transform the world as part of our mission, there's no other way to do it. We have to find ways to work um, in, in, the, in the interfaith community. Of course, we have churches that are not open to all people. And I, I know, for example, in our church, they say, oh, don't go to that church because they accept LGBTQ people. You know, that happens. But that is an opportunity also for us to be a witness that our church is different, but at the same time that we can still work together with people who have a different traditions of faith. And I, I think it's interesting how we frame these questions sometimes. So, I, I mean, just to survey quickly, uh, just just do the thumbs up uh, uh, thing there in the reactions if you are a part of an ecumenical family, 
And I, I think most of us are. I mean, I grew up in a family that was Baptist and Methodist. We went to both of them, uh, you know, growing up. I see all the thumbs going up. Yeah, yeah, great. And so I think just really relying on who we are at our core can help us navigate the space that we find ourselves in. But that's going to take us stepping off of our arrogant high horses and stop acting like we know everything and be okay with one naming we don't have the answers and being okay with verbalizing the questions that we have as a denomination and even as local churches trying to figure this out within our context. We have, we have isolated and insulated ourselves so much so to we, we only listen to ourselves and we believe what we say to ourselves about ourselves and trust that the rest of the world hears it, they don't. They just see us talking to ourselves. So I think some honesty about where we are, who we are, and what it is we really need is the way forward. Um, sorry to use that language, but <laughs> it is the way. It, sorry if that triggers people, but uh, but is it? I believe it's a way for us to use who we are at home to help us be who God is calling us to be abroad. Thank you. Next question from our chat. This one's about the wildest dreams. Our wildest dreams are possible, but not everyone shares those dreams or wants to be a part of them. What do we do about that or them? Anyone? I would say that I'm a witness of how people have changed the way they deal with this issue of, of, of inclusive of the LGBTQ people. I have seen how people believe that being gay was a sin and how they little by little get involved with, with people who are different and, and in conversations that are difficult and they are transformed. I think that we have the opportunity to witness what God is doing in each of us and trying to, to Keep being a witness to those who think differently. You know, Wesley said, think and let others think. But it's important that we always keep telling the story of what God is doing in our lives and how we see God and God's relationship with people um, all the time. And I have seen people change their mind, uh, ultra conservative people who somehow have changed and understand the dynamics of what it doesn't mean to be an inclusive church to include our LGBTQ uh, I, um, A plus siblings. I've seen that. Yeah, I, I would say that um, part, of, part of this is uh, dangerous, right? It's dangerous. When we say we want a church for all people, you know, and all means all, well, does it really? You know, <laughs> or does it, it mean all the people who believe what I believe is right or believe the way that I believe it are somehow uh, holier than, than others? And so I think a real examination of, of what it is we mean when we say a uh, church for all or a place for all uh, to really do some, some deep examination for that, because I, I, I think we can have that. I, I have examples in my own life and ministry of uh, being in deep, um, uh, abiding relationship with individuals who hold very different views than I do, but we're able to be in right relationship with each other because we don't try to force each other into something that we're not ready for or don't understand. And, and I don't love them any less, and I don't feel loved any less by them because there is an openness for folks to, to be authentically whoever they are. Now, that's not to say we create spaces and opportunities to be doormats uh, for people to walk over or to push over either, but there has to be mutual respect uh, for folks to believe, to grow, to experience what they need to experience uh, along the journey, just as we want that privilege and that opportunity, I think we have to allow that for other people as well, in order for all of us to be better, for all of us to grow more, more perfect in our love of God and of neighbor. Yeah, and I, I would just add that, you know, I will each have different roles to play in, in these scenarios. And knowing that there are people here who um, 
have been doing this work for decades and people who have just begun and people who identify as LGBTQ plus and people who have become allies to our community, knowing that everyone has a different role to play. So for me, that's not always being in those conversations with people who think differently, uh, because I know that that's spiritual harm for me. Um, if I'm always in those conversations where I have to defend my right to exist, um, I know that's not where I flourish. And so it's meant a lot to see so many United Methodists, um, straight United Methodists um, coming together to say, okay, let's educate ourselves. We're going through this reconciling process so that we can have those conversations. Um, and, and so just knowing that everyone will have different gifts and there are other uh, queer people who say, yeah, having those hard conversations is my thing. Um, and so, yeah, I think as we think about the church and people who don't share our vision, just knowing that there are, we live in a big connection uh, and that there are people with so many gifts to engage in all of these conversations in different ways, um, while also, as Cedric said, not being doormats, right? Establishing some core principles about what it means to be the United Methodist Church, including, as Lisette has raised, grace, uh, which means that we fundamentally affirm uh, the goodness of everyone. And so if if you can enter our community and affirm that everyone here is good, then we're gonna have to have a conversation about that because that's part of our fundamental principles of what we believe. Um, so I think there's some room there to have tough conversations, set a safe bar um, and still have those relationships um, depending on who we are and what our gifts are. Jan, I think you're muted. A mute. Sorry about that. Um, Izzy, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, so I'm going to assume that's it. Um, if, if I'm wrong, um, let me know. Um, and I'm going to then ask uh, one final question uh, of the panelists. And that is, I would like each of you to tell us if there's anything about the future United Methodist Church that hasn't come up in this discussion or anything about your hopes and dreams for that church um, that you share it with us. Do you have questions for each other then? while we have a minute or two left. Could JJ you say the question? Could you say the question one more time? I was reading through all the chat. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. I no, I was just asking if there's anything else you'd like to share that hasn't been covered in a in an answer to one of the previous questions. So I think that is a great sign that you all have have done a great job. So this is this is a this has been great. Um, I took lots of scribbles on the piece of paper in front of me. So um, hopefully there's ideas here that, that we'll be able to, to share more. Um, somebody in the chat, I'm gonna just answer a couple of things that we're asking the chat along the way. So everybody sees them in case you didn't. Somebody asked, are we recording this? Can we get a script of this? I believe it will be posted on at some point in the not real distant future and we will send everyone who registered a link. I hope that's the plan anyway. Um, so I'm looking to see if there's something else somebody just posted in the chat, hang on. Um, okay, thank you all um, for being here. As a, thanks to, the, to those of you who have already donated tonight. There have been several that I've seen as, as we've been sitting here. Thanks especially to our panelists. Um, we appreciate your time and investment in this this evening. Um, and again, um, thanks to those of you who've joined us. We look for more of these kinds of things. Um, let me let you all in on one other little piece of information. Some of you may have noticed this if you went out to the link and tried to, tried to donate. Um, we've been working on a new website at RMN for a year. Um, it got delayed for various reasons over the course of that year, and it went live today. <laughs> so I saw a couple of, of comments about something not working or you can't find something. So we'll, we'll follow up with you individually on those things. 
Um, we didn't plan for it to go live today, but it did. <laughs> so if you take a look at our new website, you see anything out there that doesn't work right, you can let us know. We'd appreciate it. Um, but again, thank you all. And I think that we can call that a wrap.